Sometime around 1600 BC, Tang Shang was addressing his men before the most important battle of their lives. He railed against King Jia of Xia, a corrupt tyrant who was exploiting the people and destroying cultural landmarks. Tang had enough. As rain poured down and thunder echoed across the hills, Tung gave an impassioned speech that had his men nearly foaming at the mouth. King Jia's army was so afraid and demoralized that they ran away, abandoning their crooked tyrant. The Shang Dynasty had begun, a dynasty that would usher in a marvelous age of art and architecture. The problem, though, is that this battle may never have happened. These are the mysteries of the Shang Dynasty. Royal Excess. Fast forward to the end of the Shang Dynasty around 1045 BC, and things seem to have reverted back to the corruption and tyranny that Tang of Shang rebelled against in the first place. By this time, a guy named Dishan, who later became known as King Zhou of Shang, had come to power. The Shang Dynasty had built some magnificent structures. They'd honed their bronze and stone works and developed the Taoist religion. But none of that really mattered to Dishan. Dishan loved to party, and his excessive lifestyle ultimately led to the collapse of the Shang Dynasty. It's said that in the Shang capital of Zhaosh, he had one of the craziest symbols of royal excess that might have ever been constructed. It was called the Deer Terrace Pavilion. It was apparently a massive man-made lake filled with alcohol. We don't know what kind, probably millet or rice wine. The interior of the lake was lined up with polished oval-shaped stones. In the center of the lake, was an island filled with lush vegetation and some of the strangest Christmas tree decorations you can imagine. From the branches of the trees hung roasted meat skewers. Dishan had a meat forest in the middle of an alcohol lake. I mean, the guy was off his rocker. Next thing he needed was a TV for Sunday Night Football. As you can imagine, Dishan's Deer Terrace Pavilion was built at the expense of his people. He channeled money away from infrastructure projects and stuffed it into his own pockets and to building his booze pond and hosting some pretty wild parties. The king was pretty known to throw some pretty extravagant feasts. According to legend, Dishan did all these things to win over his wicked and manipulative wife, Daji. Daji is depicted as a femme fatale, a type of figure who helped corrupt the last Shang king and speed up the fall of the empire. In some accounts, she was actually possessed by an evil fox that took over her body and started sowing all kinds of malevolent chaos. Dishan would do anything for Daji. His infatuation with her was so intense and obsessive that he started forgetting that he was actually in charge of ruling the kingdom. She loved a good, let's call it, intimate group party. So of course, Dishan built her that booze lake to romp around in. She also loved animals, so Shen built her a zoo on the palace grounds with all kinds of exotic animals. Now, I'm not sure how many of those animals ended up hanging from the branches of the meat forest. Under Daji's influence, King Shen's behavior took a dark turn. He apparently started punishing people just for the fun of it probably using a device called the bronze toaster, which Daji herself may have invented. It was an oiled up bronze cylinder that was heated like a furnace with charcoal beneath it. As the sides of the cylinder became scorching hot, the victim was forced to walk on top of it. They had to continuously shift their feet on the surface of the cylinder to avoid getting their feet burned off. And because the whole thing was oiled up, it was pretty easy to slip off and barbecue themselves on the burning charcoal below. Not a pleasant way to go. The Battle of Muye With Daji at his side and their booze lake slash meat forest slash group party slash punish palace taking up most of his time and most of the Shang Dynasty's money, it was a little wonder that Di Shen was the last king of the dynasty. All that excess came back to bite him when a guy named Jifa from the Zhu state decided to take advantage of all that disorganization and launch a revolt. He waited a few years though. People in the Shang Dynasty like to consult oracles to guide them along the proper path, something we'll get into in a little bit. Jifa was under the impression that he should wait for the proper heavenly order to be given for him to attack. Now eventually the order came and he led his forces into battle. The Battle of Muye was a strange one. According to historical records, Tishen had over a half a million troops at his disposal, but modern historians put that number much lower, like around 50 to 70,000. Dishan also gave weapons to some 170,000 peasants in a last-ditch attempt to protect his capital from Jifa's Zhou army, which numbered around 50,000 and included a devastatingly effective chariot cavalry. Dishan probably thought his 170,000 armed servants would give him the edge in the battle, but he was probably pretty disappointed when nearly all of them defected over to Zhou. 
It doesn't pay to be a crazed tyrant, and forcing your peasants to fight for you probably not the best way to earn their loyalty. To make matters worse, many fighters in his regular army refused to fight before the battle. Some did fight, though. The Battle of Muye turned into a rout for Jifa and the Zhu, who had a much more motivated and a better trained army. A chariot charge broke through the Shang's offensive line, and Shen had to retreat back to his palace. It said that enough blood was spilled during the battle to float a log, and most of that blood was Shang blood. According to some sources, when Shen retreated back to his palace, he covered himself in all his finest jade jewelry and then he set himself on fire before he could be captured. His lavish rule had come to an end. And things didn't end well for Daji either. She was eventually found and killed by Jifa. Shortly after, Jifa opened up the grain stores that Shen had been hoarded and distributed to the starving population. Jifa would soon take the title King Wu of Zhou, officially kicking off the Zhou Dynasty. Oracle Bones For centuries, most people thought these stories and the entire Shang Dynasty were nothing more than legend. But in 1899, a Chinese scholar named Wang Yirong dug up some bones near the modern city of Anyang that changed all of that. Oracle bones were inscriptions on turtle and oxen bones that were used to tell people's future. They directly led to the development of writing in China, as well as the development of religious and scientific thought. Everyone went to see an oracle and have their fortunes told, from kings to peasants. Here's how a divination session likely went down during the Shang Dynasty. In the heart of the Shang Dynasty, in the ancient city of Yin, there was a farmer who needed some guidance. His livelihood was hanging in the balance, and he needed to decide whether to bring his oxen to the market next month or wait for a better time. Choosing wrong could mean his family went hungry that winter. Zhang approached the Oracle Bone Divination Chamber. The room was dimly lit by flickering candlelight, casting shadows on curious symbols carved into the walls and shelves. The diviner, or shaman, sat cross-legged on a mat decked out with feathers and inscribed charms, waiting to help anyone seeking answers from the spiritual realm. As Zhang entered the chamber, he carried a turtle shell inscribed with symbols spelling out his question in a pretty simple way. Symbols for the farmer, the oxen, the upcoming month, and a later month were scratched into it. He placed the shell before the shaman and enunciated his question, should I bring my oxen to the market next month? The shaman took a hot poker from the fire pit nearby. The turtle shell was suspended over the pit. With a steady hand, the shaman lowered the poker onto the shell. Minutes passed and slowly the shell started to crack in a pattern from the spirit world that only the shaman could interpret. He looked up at Zhang and told him that he should indeed bring his oxen to the market in the upcoming month. Early scenes like this set the stage for writing in China. As time passed, the questions etched in these bones became more complex than simply whether or not someone should take their ox to the market. Astronomers started recording celestial events like eclipses and the movements of stars with pretty incredible precision. These oracle boat inscriptions were some of the earliest recorded accounts of astronomical phenomena. The development of writing on these bones also kicked off some significant advancements in mathematics. Principles related to odd and even numbers were developed, one of the most early developments in early mathematics. Like the Sumerians before them, a writing system helped with accounting and bureaucracy, which helped organize cities more efficiently and allowed them to grow faster. Wu Ding's Offerings, an Empire of Bones The first Shang king to pop into the written record was Wu Ding, who was described as either the 21st or 22nd king of the dynasty and reigned sometime around 1200 BC. He lived in a time where something a bit more sinister was going on in the Shang dynasty, human offering. Human offering was apparently pretty pervasive in Shang culture. Archaeologists have unearthed multiple Shang tombs and other sites that contain piles of human bones that they think were offering pits. Oftentimes, those who were sacrificed were called Chung, or barbarians. The term was one that drew a line between us and them. The Chung were tribes to the northwest of the Shang, and over the years the two groups came into conflict pretty frequently. Captured Chung were sacrificed for all kinds of reasons. Wanted to win a war? Human offering. Did a powerful ruler die? Human offering. Important holiday? Human offering. Wanted Beyonce tickets? Human? Well, you get the idea. What's more, the bones in the Shang offering pits showed signs of punishment. The Shang dynasty was certainly not a peaceful place. Some of the most common glyphs found on the aforementioned oracle bones were symbols that translate to conquest and killing. And Wu Ding was not above a bit of ceremonial bloodshed if it meant appeasing the spirits of his ancestors and getting some help winning a war. There's a legend that he sacrificed over 3,000 people in one day so he would win a war. He was also a frequenter of the oracles. 
More oracle bone inscriptions related to his rule have been found than any other Shang ruler. Before he committed to a particular military campaign, he would go visit the shaman and have his turtle shell interpreted in the same way our fictional farmer Zhang did for when he should take his ox to market. Hu Ding's oracle bone fortunes worked out pretty well for him. Under his rule, the Shang dynasty expanded significantly. Victory after victory was recorded in the bones, and despite all the human offering, the dynasty became a center of art and culture. Advances in bronze casting led to some of the most intricately designed bowls and ritual vessels that had ever been produced. Musical instruments were made, including bells, chimes, cymbals, and flutes. Wu Ding also consolidated the central authority of the empire. One of the ways he did that was by marrying one woman from each neighboring tribe. It said he had at least 64 wives. The Warrior Queen His favorite of all those wives might have been one of the most powerful women in Chinese history. Her name was Fu Hao. She was not only a wife though, she was a warrior and a high priestess who was involved in both military conquests and important religious rituals. It said that she was a general who commanded as many as 13,000 troops. She was a key part of the Shang Dynasty's expansion under King Wu Ding. While we don't know how many specifics about the battle she fought in, the fact that she is mentioned over 200 times on the oracle bones discovered in a single cave points to the power and influence she wielded during her lifetime. And then there's her tomb. Discovered in 1976, it was one of the few Shang tombs that was left untouched by looters. Inside, there were things both wonderful and horrifying. There were over a thousand jade and precious stone objects, 130 bronze weapons signifying her military prowess. There was pottery, hairpins, and nearly 7,000 cowrie shells, which the Shang used as currency. Basically, it was a treasure chest of wealth. But there were also 16 human offerings and six dog offerings. Again, despite all the art and culture and scientific advancement that occurred during the Shang Dynasty, there was also an uglier side. The fact that we know anything at all about the Shang Dynasty, including the fact that it even existed in the first place, is really miraculous. Thanks to their shamanic oracle bones, we can track the dynasty's rise and fall, one that is still full of mystery, where legend blends with fact and Chinese culture began to flourish. Thanks for watching. What other Chinese cultures would you like to learn about? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.